So, <clears throat> if you were here last week, uh, we didn't actually start talking about any of the churches last week. We looked at a group of people called the Nicolaitans and how they followed this gentleman called Balaam back from the book of Numbers and all the things that he did to the Israelites and the ways he got them to stumble and all the chaos and havoc that it caused. And what we took away from that was one person following or being controlled by the wrong spirit can cause a lot of trouble. Because I think in Numbers 25 it said 24,000 Israelites died because of Balaam and everything that he did. So our conclusion was to use the Bible as a mirror to examine ourselves to make sure we're doing right. So as we get into these churches, that's going to be the main theme is to look at ourselves because before we can see what's going on out here, we have to make sure we're right. And with that, um, tonight, uh, this will be titled The Seven Churches, and we're going to be looking at Ephesus and Sardis tonight. Because as I was studying through these, you could pair these churches together. They were either very similar in what they were doing right or what they were doing wrong, or they were just the opposite in what they were doing wrong. With one notable exception, and that's Laodicea. And we'll look at that church by itself. But tonight, uh, starting with Ephesus and Sardis, uh, just want to ask a question to get started. Uh, would you prefer Democrats or Republicans? And now you're going to run me off because I brought politics in here. But legitimate question. If, if you had to choose, would you be more Democrat or would you be more Republican? Yeah, I was going to say, I kind of feel like we'd all tend to lean more Republican in here. The thing about that, Republicans are real conservative. Republicans like their rules. Whereas Democrats tend to be a little more liberal. And we may not necessarily need all these rules. You know, we can kind of figure it out on our own. That's what we see with Ephesus and Sardis. Ephesus went a little to the right, a little too far to the right, and got very legalistic. Whereas Sardis went a little to the left, just the opposite, and got a little too liberal. So let's dive into this and take a look. Uh, so in Revelations chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we'll see uh, the text for Ephesus. So it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your work, your toil, and your patience, patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So there's a lot to unpack there. But let's look at the text for Sardis real quick. And this is in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, 
the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so there is a whole lot to unpack here and you could probably do a sermon on each church individually looking at a lot of things but the main things that the holy spirit was showing to me to cover was well what they were doing right their commendations what they were doing wrong what they got rebuked for and how to fix it if they were doing wrong. So let's jump into the commendations. What were they doing right? So we see that in chapter 2, verses 2 and 3 for Ephesus. It says, I know your work, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not found <clears throat> and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary. So there's a lot of good things there. It says that they didn't didn't let the, the false apostles and things like that get into their church. They were able to see that beforehand and that goes along with 1 John chapter 4 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets had gone out into the world. So they were on top of that. They followed that rule. And if we remember from the first, Ephesus had gone very legalistic, so they were very much in favor of following the rules, and this was a rule, so they... They, everybody that come in, it's like, we got to test them. We got to see where they're at, right? And it said that they were patiently enduring. So in John chapter 15, verse 21, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. So they, even though they were in a legalistic mind frame, they were still having to endure lots of things for the name of Jesus, like we all do. And in Hebrews 12, 3, it says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Another good thing that Jesus had to say was they weren't growing weary. You know, don't grow weary. And... Here in Hebrews, it reminds us when we're feeling that way to think about Jesus and what all he went through. Like he went through way more than what we have to go through. And if he can make it through that and our faith is in him, then his strength will get us through anything that we go through. And if we look at Sardis in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So not everybody in Sardis had went to the left. There were some people there. There was a small remnant that was still there, that was still following Jesus and doing what they needed to do. And a good example of what God can do with a remnant 
You can see that in the book of Nehemiah. And all of that is just spectacular what God can do with a remnant as long as everybody is unified under his authority. And just spoiler alert, once we get through these churches, we're going to be in Nehemiah looking at that. So, But it's a great book, and I think we'll have lots of fun looking at that too. So now the rebuke, what are they doing wrong? So for Ephesus, we find that in chapter 2, verse 4. It says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Wow. Think about that. If, if Jesus told you that today, like that would make my heart sink. Like, wow, that, that would sting. But the love you had at first, it's the love for Jesus. That's why we're all here. That's what brought us all to salvation is Jesus. And you see that in Jeremiah 2, verses 1 through 3. He said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. But isn't that what we see so often is people first get saved and they are just on fire for the Lord, just ready to go. And the longer they're a Christian, it kind of dwindles and dwindles until they're kind of on one side of the fence or the other. They're either very grumpy, if you will, and like, well, no, the rules say this, we got to do that, or they're just kind of kicked back and relaxed and like, well, whatever, man, just pray about it, you're all good. They, they kind of lose the balance there. And if we look at Sardis, that's in chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your work. You have the reputation of being alive, but are dead. That hurts too. The first thing that comes to mind when I hear that is spiritually. You're spiritually dead. And when that happens, like you have just completely forgotten about anything related to Jesus, anything related to God, and you're just kind of winging it on your own, per se. And I had a verse pop into my head when I was studying this, and it was Luke 15, 24. It says, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Well, that verse is from the prodigal son. Because in that parable, the prodigal son got his inheritance, left home, went, blew it, doing all kinds of crazy things, and finally hit rock bottom and was like, uh, I got no other choice. I've got to go back home to dad. But they welcomed him back, which is what Jesus will do. But the interesting thing, that parable actually describes these two churches. Because you see the prodigal son, we'll, we'll call the one that, that left, Sardis. He went, did his own thing, blew his money, didn't you know care about anything in the world. But there was another son at home that when the prodigal son come back and the father was giving him grace and throwing a party, he got mad. He didn't understand grace. He was very legalistic. I've been here. I've been doing all this work. I've been working and doing all this stuff. And you're going to throw him a party? He wasted all this money. So that parable kind of shows you where these two churches are at. One is way too far to the left. One is way too far to the right. 
So the resolution. So for Ephesus, we see that in chapter 2, verse 5. And it says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So, repentance. And we'll see that mirrored again in Sardis. Repentance. We have to admit we're wrong first before we can repent. But Jesus is telling them, remember the works you did at first. In Hebrews 10, 32, it says, But recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. So why are we being told to think back? Because... When we first met Jesus and first got our salvation, we were on fire for it. The sufferings, the things that come at us didn't hurt as bad. Because, hey, I've got a Savior I can go to. This isn't really making sense. Let me go to Jesus. This is kind of crazy. I don't know what to do. Let me go to Jesus. Remember those days. Because that is what will get you through those sufferings. And help you to not turn into the, the grumpy dictator, if you will. And for Sardis, we see in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up. I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Again, we see repentance. But we also see Jesus saying, wake up. Wake up, everybody. You're falling asleep. You're dying, and you don't even realize it. In 2 Timothy verse, or chapter 1, verse 13, it says, follow the pattern of of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And if you remember, Timothy followed Paul. He learned practically everything he knew from Paul about running churches and all of his ministry. You think Paul told him, well, just pray about it, man, you'll be all right. No, you get to work. I mean, look at what he says in 2 Thessalonians. If someone won't work, don't have anything to do with them. So, when you have folks that tend to be more liberal, they don't necessarily want to do the work. They're more of a, uh, well, I'll pray about it and see what the Lord does. When they should be stepping up and working. But the pattern there, the main pattern is repentance. So, if you are able to change, if you are able to repent, the Lord does list some rewards. So, for Ephesus, in chapter 2, verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And for Sardis, that's in chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. It says, Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not sold their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. These rewards sound awesome. At least to me, they do. I know these rewards we will not see while we're here on earth. But if we can overcome the liberal spirit, if we can overcome the religious spirit or the legalistic spirit, these are things that we can expect when we get to heaven. So... The question that's looming, you had one church that 
didn't really want to do any work. They just, okay, let me just quote, unquote, pray about everything. At one church that it was very much works-based. So is it faith or is it works? In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, he answers this question. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly, poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active all along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So you can also say from this, if faith without works is is dead faith, then works without faith is the same thing. Because it takes both to have them. You can't be just all faith and, yep, I'm just going to stand here and ask the Lord to provide me everything I need and not actually work or do anything. Or I'll ask him to provide everything that y'all need and not actually give it to you if I have it. But at the same time, you can't stand over here and say, well, if you don't follow the rules, you're wrong. And everything is rule, 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 rule. So we got to make sure that we don't go too far to the left or too far to the right. It takes both. And it takes a healthy mix and a healthy balance of both. So the spirits of religion or legalism and liberalism are responsible for pushing us too far to the left or too far to the right. So the religious spirits, an example that you can see in the Bible of those guys, are the Pharisees. Very rule-based. you gotta got to follow the rules. I mean, Jesus even made fun of them for tithing out of their spice rack. Because they, they, you got to follow the rules down to the last set of spices in your spice rack. An example of the liberal spirit is the sluggard in Proverbs. Because he doesn't want to work. He wants everybody else to provide for him. He wants everybody else to, to help him do everything. So... I had to kind of rewrite the closing here a little bit. Uh, on my way home, the Lord wanted to change a few things. Uh, but a few signs of a legalistic spirit. They have a lack of true joy. They can't have that true joy because in their mind, their works aren't perfect. And they have no real victory over sin because they don't understand the grace of God. They don't understand how that works. So they don't receive his grace. They have an unhealthy performance orientation. 
You have to be perfect. Your works have to be perfect or you don't measure up. They're critical or unloving towards others. And since they don't understand the grace of God, they can't give it. They can't give it freely to other people. They have an excessive focus on outward standards, the man-made rules. They take what it says in, in the Bible and they add to it a lot of extra stuff because something happened a long time ago with their grandparents and they put a rule in place to help them stay in line with God's word. But now that's the standard. Not God's word, but their rule. They're in bondage to religious tradition. So they say things like, well, this is the way we've always done it. Which kind of goes back to the other example. Their grandparents or great-grandparents put something in place and, well, this is the way we've always done it. They have a sectarian attitude towards others. Meaning, they believe their way is the only right way to do things. And they have little to no assurance of their own salvation. And this is due to their belief in their works and not their belief in the works of Jesus. So, a legalistic spirit, someone who has this spirit, they tend to gravitate towards certain verses of the Bible. One of them is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if somebody comes to them and has an issue, they may sit there and listen because, you know, the paragraph four of section three of the church bylaws say that I must sit here and listen to you, so I'm going to follow that rule. But when you get done, it's... Well, just remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Have a good day. I got to go. Boop. And they're gone. And it doesn't help the person. Signs of a liberal spirit. They have a lowered view of the Bible. So they don't, in their mind, they don't have to do everything it says. And they especially downplay the works side of things. These are people who prefer feelings over facts. Eventually, if they go far enough, the essential doctrine starts being reinterpreted. So, you may have seen some stuff about current churches allowing, you know, LGBTQ people to lead churches and they're flying rainbow flags and they're doing things against the word of God. They're reinterpreting that doctrine because they went so far. And then they start to redefine terms. And then the gospel shifts from repentance to tolerance. The verses that liberal spirit folks tend to gravitate to are verses like Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks shall receive, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knoweth it shall be opened. Knocketh, excuse me, not knoweth. I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> but they, they gravitate towards that and then they twist it because that obviously is not what Jesus is meaning by that. But they take it out of context and say, well, I can just sit here and do whatever I want to do and just ask Jesus for it, and he'll just give it to me. Well, that's not at all what he meant by that. So one last point, if you will. These two spirits, one of the things that really exposes people to these spirits and I, I, this, I know this isn't the only thing, but it is something that we may be familiar with, is church hurt. If something happens in a church and 
it splits or people leave, there's some hurt there. And that will allow these spirits to come in and divide people. And then you will have some that, well, you know, because all of this happened, we need to put these rules in place. We need to do this and we need to do that to make sure it doesn't happen again. And then you'll have some that are just the opposite. They're like, well, you know, we just need to pray about it and see what the Lord does and all this. So that is one thing that can really expose us to these spirits. And just like last week, the best way to protect ourselves from this is to use the Bible as a mirror. To help ourselves see if we're starting to have any of these tendencies. And we're starting to go a little too far right or a little too far left. And if we see that, it, Jesus tells us, repent. Return back to the middle. Return back to him and focus on him and not be so liberal minded or so legalistic. So, with that, I would say, definitely, you want to use your Bible as a mirror before you use it for binoculars to look at anybody else. And we have to use it as a mirror to make sure our hearts are right and our minds are right before we will even be able to notice any of this other stuff that's going on. Because if we have legalistic tendencies... We think it's normal, and we won't see it anywhere else. But as soon as we get ourselves right with Jesus, then we can see it. Same with the liberal. So that's all I have, and just encourage and reiterate, mirror, use it as a mirror. But we always need to be examining ourselves. And with that, I'll close this in some prayer. And if anybody wants to come forward and pray, you're more than welcome to. Heavenly Father, we come to you again tonight. And we want to thank you, Lord, for being here with us as we read your word and studied. And we thank you for showing us all the things that you wanted us to see. And we just ask, Lord, that you help us to remember to look to you and to use your word as a mirror to examine our own selves so that we're not going too far to the left or too far to the right and that we can stay in the middle and stay focused on you. And Lord, as we go through the rest of our week, we just want to ask that you watch over everyone here, the rest of our church family who's not here. We we ask that you watch over them as well and just help us to recall the lessons that you've shown us here tonight whenever we need them and help us to remember that and to stay focused on you, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.